This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show. Hey guys, this is the Indie Mayhem Show. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studios in Pittsburgh, PA. This is where we talk with people in and around independent professional wrestling and international superstars, apparently, today. Uh, you can check out everything WrestlingMayhemShow.com, IndieWrestling.us. Many of the things that people that we talk to and about are on a lot of those platforms and other uh, podcasts and content as well. Uh, a lot a lot going on. I mean, some other things you'll be interested in, too. Hit us up, good times at WrestlingMayhemShow.com or 412-206-WMS0 if you have any questions for any announced... This is not an announced one today, and not officially... Uh, but if you have our announced guests or if uh, uh, if you have any questions for them or if you have anybody to suggest for the show, because damn it, there's a lot of wrestling and I'm barely even catching up on my WWE UK NXT. So uh, we're getting I'm, I need you know, trying to find time for Impact, Ring of Water, plus everything else and all the friends of the show that are just doing amazing out there. So with me today, first of all, Joe Dombrowski is here. He's back sporting that classic prime wrestling shirt. I, 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 I admire that. Going a little bit old school. That's right. Um, thank you for having me. I'm going to take offense to you. I uh, believe you were referring to me when you said international superstar. Yes. The international part is true. I don't think the superstar part is true. I'm a person that went somewhere else more so <laughs> You're than a person else. that went international. Going, and it's not, not your first superstar. time going international. I used to go to England. You used to go to England. I don't anymore. They figured out <laughs> I'm not any talented. Yeah. Uh, I've been to Canada, but I, I was in Mexico uh, this past Saturday for Triple Mania 27. Yes. Great opportunity. I'm very thankful uh, of me and Matt Stryker. You can go to twitch.tv, sign up for Triple A's English feed, and check me out there. 100% free Fantastic. of charge. Four-hour show. I definitely want to ask you a little bit more about that, and I know uh, I, I think there's some people that watch it that probably have some questions that'll be in the feed as well. Um, including some old friends of yours in the chat room, some of the sounds of it. But uh, uh, I don't have any friends. They're there's, full of crap. There's, there's also another guest here. Joe, do you want to introduce our other guest? I would love to introduce our other guest mm-hmm. because he is the Pope of Grope. Ooh. He is the Lord of Lude. He is Lascivious Maximus. He is the perpetual pervert of Pittsburgh professional wrestling <laughs> as I pop my peas for Sorg. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the legendary my good, close, personal, dear, long-time friend, delicious Jimmy DeMarco. He's trapped on the other side of the pillow fort. You are. You have, like, this pillow fort going oh, on. Oh, it's good, because I can get under like this. Hey. Hey. I like it. <laughs> Jimmy DeMarco, it's been a while. Well, we haven't seen you in, in a wrestling ring for, for at least, what, six months at this point. Seems longer. It seems longer. It feels that way. Look, look. It feels that way, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> Jimmy's so soft-spoken. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to. Well, I don't want to be too loud and then yell into it and be all. Yeah, you know, then you hear like. It's okay. I just popped on my peas, so that's right. I'm that's right. I'm, hand, I'm handling popper. it over here. So, anyways, uh, so and I think I think there's a special occasion you guys wanted to talk about today. Well, I wanted to wish uh, Jimmy DeMarco happy anniversary because. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's your it's the Joe and Jimmy anniversary. It, 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 it is special anniversary for us because it was. Um, 10 years almost to the day since we were nearly thrown off of a major regional <laughs> cable television property. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. we almost broke the internet before breaking the internet was a thing. Mm-hmm. Time flies. Um, the pre YouTube, early YouTube, pre YouTube yeah, days. We're, I we're talking 2009. This Friday um, is August 9th, I believe. That will be 10 years to the day since. Uh, PWO Resolution 2 mm-hmm. when we were supposed to have the Jimmy DeMarco Gregory Iron <laughs> blow off match. I wouldn't use that word for when, the climate. Well, the, the climax. The, um, <laughs> the last match between the two of them that was going to be had, <laughs> but two weeks prior on television, uh, things got a little bit weird and we had to deal with a little bit of controversy. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, for the first time ever, 
since that airing. I have unearthed the footage. Um, I've only heard. I don't think anybody's shown me this footage. Well, I've only seen it once. And- yeah, yeah, and that I I I watched it when we shot it, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and I watched it back today. And lived for, it. for those un yeah, I was in it. <laughs> for those uninitiated, we're talking about the infamous Jimmy DeMarco to catch a predator segment <laughs> that aired. In July, I don't know of why that got in any kind of trouble when you call it to catch a predator. You know? Well, because you were being like a, a a predator in terms of you were stalking the family. You have to have an open mind to get the humor behind it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, it was you know it's no different than like in a movie when uh, there's an asshole and you send him to the wrong address. You know, he thinks he's going to meet a hot blonde and he walks into a, a club full of bikers who are going to kick his ass. You know there what I mean? So, it, so it that's setup. very Police Academy of you with exactly, that Exactly, yeah. I didn't know if anyone would get the, the Blue Oyster. Blue right. Oyster, there you go. I'm with you. So a little a little background. This is back in the Pro Wrestling Ohio, later Prime Wrestling days. This was on television. Yes. Uh, Sports Time Sports Ohio, Time Ohio, Ohio which part. was the official cable network of the Cleveland Indians, by the way. You said that Available you, in millions of homes. You said that a lot on the air, didn't you? Basic cable. <laughs> yes. A lot of people watching. Yes. Uh, so, it, and, and, and I probably also for context, what was the time slot you guys had? We were on, I think at that point we were on Sunday, we were on Sunday nights at 10 o'clock. Yeah, because so. I remember I got flooded with messages around like 1130. Yeah. <laughs> And I got the message just Monday morning. I was just telling you guys before we went on, I never, I had always heard where the audience reached, how far the show reached. I lived in Pittsburgh. I never got it. Yeah, it was a, Cle- it was a Cleveland regional station. And right? I never put too much thought into it about where it reached or didn't reach, whatever, until after that episode. And then I got the messages of, you know, you sick son of a bitch. How could you do? <laughs> and I was like, oh shit, a lot of people really do watch this show. Holy shit. And then it was, you know, uh, it just spawned from there, like. And by the way, you're not on it anymore. <laughs> oh no! I mean, that was that was the. I, I I didn't care whenever Joe was like, "Hey, you know, you need to go away for a little bit here," because I was like, "Hey, I don't want to be the asshole who brings down. Nobody wants to be that guy who costs, who brings a promotion down and costs a place to a good place to work for everybody else." You know, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I was yeah. mainly concerned about. And I knew Wally, uh, you know, his his ass is on the line. And to Joe and Wally's credit, when I did come back. Before I, you know, got like made retarded in a car accident, the uh, Joe and Wally separately each offered to pay me for missing resolution too. Oh wow! And I, it, uh, Wally wasn't as nice as Joe was. <laughs> Joe, Joe he never offered was. me, and I had to politely decline. When Wally offered to pay me for still resolution two, I was he was like, I don't know what the can I can I swear here? I don't. Yeah, swear. yeah, yeah. You can I swear. don't know what the fuck Joe was thinking <laughs> putting that on the air. I don't know what went through his goddamn mind. <laughs> But I told them both, you know, I, I, I'm just happy you guys are still going. I'm happy yeah. you're still living. You know? And I, I think I think we should kind of set the way back machine and tell, tell the whole story start to finish before we actually get into the meat of... of <laughs> the fallout. <laughs> yeah, the, the fallout and, and the actual events because, um, you know, I mean, I, I met Jimmy DeMarco um, probably officially sometime in 2004 when he was training and got to know him through the years afterwards. And the one thing I had always seen in Jimmy DeMarco was passion. Mm -hmm. And I had always seen loyalty and I had always seen just somebody that was willing to risk their body, risk anything that they possibly could to make it in this business. And at that point in time, Jimmy was kind of typecast as the cousin of the Gambino family, Mickey Mm -hmm. and Marshall. And Jimmy had the opportunity to kind of put his own flavor on things as time went on, but he really didn't have a chance to really um, develop into a single star as of yet. And meanwhile, on the other side of that coin, I had started working in Cleveland for the late, great JT Lightning, Cleveland All Pro Wrestling Television, which was the first wrestling property that was on Sports Time Ohio. Um that went about a year until there was a rift in the upper management there. And through that rift is how PWO got formed. PWO wound up with the time slot, and I wound up with a booking position under Josh Prohibition. Mm-hmm. And there wasn't a lot of wiggle room for using talent at that point from outside of kind of the core. But when it came to Pittsburgh guys, Jimmy was on my short list of the top 
you know, top three, top five, whatever, of guys I wanted to give an opportunity for because I saw something there as a performer, as a personality, and moreover as somebody that would, you know, do whatever it takes to get the job done, to stand out, to get over. And that's what he did. And we had a lot of fun the first year and a half with the Jimmy DeMarco character presenting something outside the box. Um, we had the uh, infamous censored promo. Do you remember Wh- that? Which I am actually playing right now by chance. Well, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I remember you asked me. It was uh, like December of 07 after that that show where norm what would he do like the back-to-back nights or whatever and you asked yeah. me to come work for you and i was like oh you sure like i couldn't believe that you wanted me to you know and i was like yeah sure and then it spawned it like slowly snowballed like we did the uh promo and i remember prohibition had said to you i don't think we can use any of this and you're like we'll just edit all of it yeah he he, <laughs> he said if i air this off to delete like every third word and i said do it it's gonna make it funnier that way because I believe most of the most of the uh, uh, you compared Marion Fontaine to like uh, uh, bisexual porn star. Yeah, and... which there's a market for that. Like I, I oh, 100 percent. My whole thing was, you know, <laughs> some people were afraid to. Oh, I don't want to look macho if I if I uh, say this and this nowadays. You know, I hate to seem old, but you know, if you, oh, there's like 8,700 genders. Well. I was a hundred genders before a hundred genders was a thing. You know what I mean? I was just, I was the gender. There was no, there was no, you know, I was every single flavor. If you took it and you mixed it all into one. You were the most gender fluid superstar. My whole thing was, <laughs> and I looked at it this way. If you're into muscles, men, and the penis, then you better be into me. I don't, I'm not grossed out by it. That's my job. If I, hey, I don't give a shit what you recognize yourself as. If I'm not turning you on, then I'm pissed. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to let you hop on it, but, I mean, that's the great adventure right there. That's the fishing. You know, when you're in that cage and you're in a cage and there's sharks in the water, and you're, ah, 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 there's a thrill of the shark coming up and hitting the cage. I want that cage door open. I want him to come in and be like, ah. <laughs> you know, that's how you describe it. But back then... When you said something like that, they'd be like, you know, they'd call you slurs, they'd call you names. Nowadays, man, I might be the most popular guy in the world if I was still, you know, I'm not saying that's how I really am, wink, wink, but, you know. Nothing's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, and it's it's great. While you were going through all that, I, I noticed on the B-roll we had the shot of you in drag. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Jimmy DeMarco was banned from the building, and this, I mean, Jim Cornette did this back in the day. A lot of a lot of villains did this back in the day. He was banned from the building, uh, so he snuck in in drag. He had, like, a brick in his purse, hit Marion Fontaine in the head, cost Fontaine a match. And Fontaine had a character with him, managing him, who was, I forget his full name, but his, his last name is Grosh. Macho Grosh. Yeah, his, 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 his working name was Macho Grosh. He's, he's, Grosh is actually his real last name. He's friends with Josh and M-Dog. He was just there to be kind of a wacky sidekick to Marion Fontaine. So, all right, how can we utilize this character in a way that, that makes sense to this reality? Well, he sees a you know, a, a buff looking entity in, in women's clothing. <laughs> Obviously he's going to get a crush on, on uh, Jimmy DeMarco, who Jamie Scott had dubbed honey baby, by the way. <laughs> um, so we, we had DeMarco do the run in with the brick and then he, he's running out of the building. Our backstage interviewer stops him and, says, uh, what are you doing? This is obviously premeditated. And DeMarco says, what do you mean premeditated? You don't know how I live my life outside of here. <laughs> and and he just keeps running. And um, this leads to uh, Macho Grosh being smitten with Honey Baby and proposing marriage. And we, we recreate the whole Macho and Liz thing, you know, will you marry me? And um, this all leads somehow with our winding road to Marion Fontaine and Jimmy DeMarco in a kiss my butt match at the very first resolution at the Nautica Pavilion. <laughs> um, and Fontaine, Fontaine was one of those characters, man, he was down for anything. And I've put him in some very advantageous situations and I've put him in some situations I've had to apologize for later, but he was always game for, for all of it. I mean, you, you enjoyed working with Fontaine, right? Oh, by far one of the top five favorite people that I've ever worked with. He was just, whether it was an AIW or with you or I think I wrestled him once in IWC and we got some suggestive chance up in a very like laid back area. 
It was, he was always, me and him had a lot of chemistry. I love, I, I really enjoyed that chemistry. And you guys brought out the best and the most out of each other's characters too. He, one time we worked on a bar show in AIW and he gave me a mandible claw with a condom <laughs> and I was screaming so loud that it sucked down my throat. And for a split second, I was like, I'm going to fucking die in this dive bar until I went <laughs> and spit it out real fast because you don't realize there's lube on that. You know what I mean? And the mandible claw, when applied properly, I think Bray Wyatt's doing it now and bringing it back. It went two fingers down. And I was like, ah! <laughs> it was like, thank God I have a muscular throat. And I was able to just like shoot that. You know what I mean? Like Hashtag muscular throat. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, the mandible claw can be a very paralyzing maneuver. Um, <laughs> without the condom. So I can only imagine... <laughs> Once you add the condom and the lubricant, it's just it's too much. To well, add. yeah, I don't. I mean, I never, I never took the lubricant into uh, account. I didn't realize how lubed up those things were. I see, I don't use them. I'm sterile. Awkward silence. Now, so, <laughs> and, and speaking of awkward moments, I will take the time to publicly apologize for you for whose ass you had to kiss that night. Oh, I didn't care about um, that. What the uh, big Samoan? The Naj the wild Samoan who. Was a Samoan from Hawaii or whatever the frig he tried to make his entrance into. But yeah, Naj the Wild Samoan was the uh, surprise that was bestowed upon me that night to <laughs> write into the segment. And unfortunately, Marco's face ended up in one of uh, Naj's crevices somewhere. And uh, we got, we, it was a feel good moment, uh, uh, I guess. I, I mean, depending <laughs> on where you were sitting. <laughs> but, uh, that was that was the uh, the comeuppance for the character for for the mind games that he played with Fontaine and Grosh and all that type of thing. How did it even come about? I forget how the uh, whole Greg and his little brother thing. I think the one time he was sitting in the crowd and when we were driving home from a show, we were just talking and I said, "Wouldn't it be crazy if somebody <laughs> if somebody tried to, to kidnap Greg's little brother and turn him against them?" <laughs> Here, here's how I remember it. That's started. a ra- That's an old Raven thing, wasn't it? Well, it was like I, my, whole, my whole thing behind it was: if you ever seen the movie Problem Child, the little kid, uh, the dude who played Kramer on Seinfeld, he was the yeah. bow tie killer. Yeah, he, him and the little kid, he he wanted to turn the kid into like a basically a little mini serial killer. So it was never like a sexual thing. It was like I'm gonna. What would hurt the most for an inspirational person like Greg than to take his little brother who looks up to him and turn him in like? Turn him into an evil person, like turn against them. That's the one person Greg had in the world. Let's turn him against them. But, you know, we couldn't let that play out. Yeah. Because people were sour. Here, here's what how I remember it starting. Because the thing is, is, is when I'm booking a, 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 a program, a supercard, television, whatever, um, obviously most people listening now, you want to have something for everybody. You got to have every different flavor of ice cream. And you've got to have. The Gargano match for the internet fans, and you're going to have the weapons match for the bloodthirsty fans, and you got the the women's match because that has a demo, and you got to have you know your indie darlings on the undercard, and you got to have your 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 six man tag, and you got to have your ground match and your flippy match. You got to have everything kind of covered, and um, one element we were looking for, and we would be myself and a couple other people, um, we wanted something a little darker a little more controversial we wanted something to to because greg had just come off of an incredible story with gargano yeah an the, awesome match that first uh the, resolution. the first resolution the last man standing match we had the whole story of gargano is the privileged punk kid who thought greg didn't deserve to be in his league and greg is the handicapped hero rising above adversity and proving he belonged and I remember year two from a booking standpoint it was a little weird for me at first because there was like a there was like a five month gap where we didn't run events, and that was I think that was the boss's call to recoup some money. But, but so creatively, I didn't really have a twelve month story arc like I I would used to. It was like more so March through June, and then the pay per view would be in August. Um, but the idea got brought up. And it was probably through a course of talking with Jimmy, talking with Greg, talking with a couple other people of what if um, something happened with with Greg's brother, Zach? Because Zach at this point was 11 years old. He was in the front row of a lot of the events, looked up to his brother. He was there. He was, you know, he, he was he was noticeable. So 
maybe there's something there and we can have kind of a darker, more controversial edge to this. And this can be kind of the, you know, that, that, um, that, that, that story that pushes the envelope a little more and, and, and crosses the boundaries. So again, DeMarco being established as this, this player of mind games who would just mess with your head and just cackle evilly about it as he would often do. Um, we sent DeMarco out there with the video camera to, uh, follow Greg and his brother. And, uh, Greg would be, um, holding his brother, you know, hand to hand, the good hand and, uh, walking him home from school or pushing him on the swing or whatever the case may be. And Jimmy would turn the microphone or the camera to himself and he would say, uh, See, Greg, I mean, you're not a good role model for this kid. I'm going to teach this kid all the best cigarettes to smoke. I'm going to teach him all the best <laughs> liquor to drink. I'm going to teach him the classy strip clubs to go to. I'm going to make a man out of him. I'm going to show him exactly what Which, it's like. that right there, you know it's it's for uh, dramatic effect and it's entertainment. Because if you really want to have a good time, you don't go to the classy strip clubs. You go to the dive ones. See, you know? I mean, <laughs> you, just, you, you read between the lines. And, and this is such really an educational episode. Uh, <laughs> so so we had that set and i was on the phone with somebody and i will not out their name at least on the air um <laughs> and i and let me make this clear i'm not absolving guilt because i'm the one that put pen to paper and i'm the one that put fingers to keyboard so yeah, yeah. um i'm the one that greenlit this so so whatever credit or blame comes out of this goes goes to me but I was on the phone with somebody. I was helping keep him awake. He was driving home from a show. And uh, he said to me, you know, wouldn't it be funny if Jimmy tried to go into the house and it turned into to catch a predator? My God, that's genius. <laughs> sort of. Um, <laughs> and we wound up doing it. And, and, and by the way, to catch a predator was like, Really, like the thing at that. Oh like, my god, it was such. Yeah. It was yeah, such this a was like at the height show. of the uh, catch a predator thing. Yeah. yeah it, okay, we might have some young fans out there. Explain very briefly ca- to catch a predator. To catch a predator was a spinoff of the Dateline NBC series where Chris Hansen, Perverted Justice, was Chris it? Hansen <laughs> teamed up with a internet watchdog group called Perverted Justice. Wow, <laughs> that sounds that sounds like your superhero group. <laughs> <laughs> like that you, that's what fitting. we could have called you and flexor when you were teaming for a while yeah. oh my yeah. god that's tremendous they uh, that there's some comic book illustrator out there just salivating at that idea oh i'm sure a couple are listening right now um so they would they would uh, the perverted justice would pose as underage children to lure Online, sexual online, yeah, online, online. To, to, and then in the house too. <laughs> yeah. But they they'd lure sexual predators to the house, and um, once they got there, Hanson would confront them with the chat logs and tell them they're free to go after you even, humiliating them. You even hit the Hanson uh, catchphrase. Why don't you have a seat perfectly? <laughs> <laughs> I remember the door open that coming. I'm like Zach, Zach, where? It didn't help things that I was calling him snack. You know, like I, I don't think you said snackery in that shot though. No, 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 not there. I'm just saying in general, like, but to me, it was just another thing of the mind game. You know what yeah. I mean? It was never anything like, uh, I don't know. I, like my whole viewpoint of the whole situation was if you watch a movie, like I know a lot of people, the movie Revenge of the Nerds, I don't know if you're familiar with it. They're called, you could never make that movie today. And I'm like, well, why not? Because if you watch Revenge of the Nerds, it's about a group of nerds. I mean, and there are all kinds of it, whatever you want to call nerds, outcasts, whatever. They get bullied, they get harassed, but in the end, they come out on top. So, are you so sensitive that you can't even let a story play out that will make you feel good at the end? Because, well, the journey kind of makes me feel like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Like, imagine I'm going to turn Jaws off as soon as it, you know, eats a little boy, or uh, something more relevant. After Thanos snaps, well, let's issue a warrant for Josh Brolin's arrest, and we're gonna, you know, you're not gonna see the next chapter. It's just that that's that's un- uncalled for. You keep, you gotta let it play out. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. And yeah. the thing is, is is that people take wrestling in a different context. Well, that's than the a problem movie is because they, it's, it's yeah, live action. They either mm-hmm. take it as well, that shit's fake, and you know it's garbage entertainment, or they take it as oh my god, I can't believe they did that. So what? Were you gonna have your cake and eat it too? Which it's, is it? You it know, which kinda, do you want it as? It's perceived as a little too 
close to real sometimes. Yeah. So well, what do you want it as? You know, and, yeah. and, and and especially 10 years ago, you know what I mean? Like we were talking about the fallout and everything like that. People went nuclear over it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. Well, let, let, let's and let's set the stage for the segment too um, before we get into the fallout. Because um, I remember we had done um, we'd done a few of those vignettes where you were you were kind of stalking the irons when they're and the, like taking the school and on the swing. And yeah, stuff. yeah. And we had built towards there was a weekend of shows in June. Um, there were basically it was going to be the six weeks of television that was going to be the hard sell. Um, should we talk about what was supposed to happen on those shows? With uh, the hammer, there was something <laughs> you were. So, you, I was going to take a hammer to Greg's good hand. You can take or, a hammer or, or, or to his good hand. hand, and then the kid was going to run in, right? Yeah, he was going to get decked. Like he, I mean, it wasn't going to be like a beating, but he was maybe like an like, elbow. Down yeah, or yeah, 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 yeah. But th- there was going to be some kind of like physical confrontation. Um, where Jimmy would go over the line, and again, it would get very dark, and you'd see this kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, like the serial killer mentality where you can lure them into the web and then strike. Um, we didn't get to that. Um, should we talk about why we didn't get into that? Uh, no. <laughs> um, Jimmy was unavailable to me that weekend. <laughs> but uh, but we, we were able to shoot the, um, we were able to shoot the Predator thing. And now you have to understand, again, in my out of the frame of wrestling booker and just into the frame of of human being, um, I'm a big freedom of speech guy. And I don't think just my personal opinion, I don't think there should really be a lot of boundaries for the sake of comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, a a lot of people condemn certain words, certain terms, certain actions. um, But to me, it all comes down to context. Absolutely. You know, it, yeah, if you're going to use a certain slur as a way to make people smile and, and mock a person that would use those slurs or mock a situation that slur might be used, that's much different than using it for a way that's designed to hate or divide somebody. Oh, absolutely. If there's hate and there's intent to like degrade somebody behind it without any kind of retribution, it's totally in bad taste. But if you do it in the right setting where the person comes off as an idiot, comes off as you know what i mean and then gets what's coming to them it could be done perfectly and i you know and and i i think the best mainstream example of that again to older fans would be archie bunker back in the day all in the family he was extremely politically incorrect and did not like minorities did not like gays wanted women to be subservient uh hated his liberal (laughs) son-in-law he hated everything that was progressive about america but people loved the character because Archie Bunker, the character, showed his ass every episode. Exactly. There was yeah. that moment where you you realized that he was outsmarted and he was proven wrong. And maybe to an extent, even he realized that, even though he wouldn't show it. And that's what made the show so endearing and made the character last for whatever it was, 12 years. Um, this was an attempt at, at dark comedy. It was not a parody of... Um, the problem itself in our culture, but it was a parody of the specific television show Mm -hmm. that was showcasing it. Um, You talked about the catchphrases that we had hit. You talked about, we had um, the cameraman on a chair to mimic a a, a security camera. What was the uh, screen name that I had? I don't remember because Uh, we... When you uh, had the chat log, you were like, you are a screen name, so-and-so. We censored it. Okay. <laughs> it, it might have been something that we look back at later and realized, okay, maybe that has a certain context to it. Because literally, if you go back and watch it, uh, and we'll be able to, I'll give everybody the link. Um, when I say the screen name, <laughs> there's a really bad overdub of an airplane noise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it looks like we're just shooting near an airport way too closely. Um but you walk into the house. I mean, what what's great is is and in in hindsight, it makes zero freaking sense. But you brought your own camera because it starts with you talking to a camera. That I'm here, Greg, and you're out of town wrestling. <laughs> and you walk in the house looking for Zach, and um, I come out of the uh, the curtain kitchen. There, yeah. <laughs> there's a drink and cookies laying out. By the way, um, I got the chat logs in my hand, and I asked him to take a seat. What are you doing here? 
Um, and he's answering the questions. Uh, who are you here to see? And we, we go through the whole Catch Predator script. We go through the taglines. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and I read from the chat log. And the chat log was all Jimmy DeMarco shitting on Gregory Iron. Yeah, it was all him saying your your brother's pathetic. He's a terrible role model. I'm gonna kick his ass. At Resolution two, Jimmy, kick his ass. Is that something appropriate to say to an 11 year old child in the chat room? No. I remember there was one one thing you read from the chat log, and I didn't have a comeback. And I think I just said, "Oh shit." <laughs> we had we had some bleeps. Yeah, yeah it was bad. It was it, it wasn't bad, but it was. There was no defense for whatever it was. That yeah. You read. And I remember when I sat down on the couch, I grabbed a pillow and I put it over my lap because I had been watching episodes of uh, the show. It's a really parody. And a lot of them were We doing- scouted this like professionals, yeah. okay? And a lot of them were doing it either like because they were so nervous they were hanging onto the pillow or – I mean some of them were probably ha- hiding uh, – a thing, you know, a pop up or whatever you want to call it. Like a they were, but like I, I, I thought, oh, it's the best way to look like, oh, I'm nervous is to hold on to the pill. You know what I mean? But and again, another thing that makes this so absurd is that, and at one point I even go to say, well, Jimmy, I have something to tell you, and I go to introduce myself, and Jimmy's like, I know who you are, you idiot. I've known you for five years. <laughs> Like the whole thing is very much tongue firmly in the cheek, and watching it back, if you wanted to be angry at it, if you wanted to misinterpret it, yeah, you absolutely could. But there was no mention of sexuality. There was no mention of any type of overt actions or words that would tell you. If you had never seen To Catch Predator before, you, I don't think, would be able to make that leap. I think the problem was the only – anybody who followed the PWO or was a fan of it or, or wrestling in general would see that and laugh or got it. I think the problem was the people who didn't get it and who, yeah. who saw it. Or even, just, or even like people who just flipped through at 1015 on Sunday imagine? night and saw this thing yeah. and only this heard my some, some of the responses and, and don't know it's wrestling yeah. or don't know the backstory. And, and you know what? And, and, and to me, the thing about that that was great is that even though the DeMarco character was, was – metaphorically speaking, kind of emasculated as far as me sitting him down and, you know, talking down to him and no, no, you don't do that. We still left on heat because then DeMarco pulled out the freaking hammer and threatened me. <laughs> he didn't, he, he didn't get arrested because I'm not, I'm I never, not, I never hear about this part. Yeah, which, which is crazy because it's like, why was I coming to meet the kid with a hammer? You know what I mean? Like it, that, that part of it, I, I mean, maybe could have, been taken like oh shit he was planning something like maybe but i mean with, I, my whole thing was i was gonna smash his toys you know like <laughs> we, and we did have you empty your pockets and you had like an american flag in there you had a bunch of random stuff that did like a ping pong ball like not helpful and wait anything. is this where the flag came from that's where the flag came from. Okay, yeah, like, I, I jumped later and there's just like a flag on the coffee table. Yeah, well, we got to empty your pocket. I was okay. looking for condoms, especially the kind with yeah. the lube, because we talk about how dangerous those are. <laughs> they, yeah. they usually roll up with uh, condoms and... Uh, and he that? threatens like, me Mike, with a hammer Mike's now because he, he just realized, wait a minute, you th- you're, there's no cops here. And he's threatening me. And it ends with a hard sell for the match at Resolution 2. Because obviously, I overstepped my bounds... As a, as a journalist, quote-unquote, to try to get the story and catch DeMarco there with cameras. And DeMarco's pissed. And now, if, if I'm a fan, I'm thinking to myself, oh, shit, DeMarco's pissed. Greg's in trouble. His brother's going to be there. Oh, man, I can't miss that resolution, too, now. And we fade out on that. That was supposed to be, that was supposed to be the goal there. DeMarco was trying to morally corrupt the the Greg's little brother slash you know take him uh, uh, in under his wing and 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 teach him whatever sorts of things Jimmy DeMarco does and the big mistake there was was on my part was a massive misread of the audience mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think wrestling fans got it to this day wrestling fans still talk about it wrestlers still talk about it because. 
um, you know, th- this legend had lived for years about, um, you know, what this heinous thing was and how, how perverted we both are and how much we hate each other after that. We can't stand each other. There were so many urban legends that the anonymous people would uh, would talk about that I never played into because I'm not a mark for myself like so many other people that did it. Um, like people never got that if you go on your social media and say, oh, it's anonymous people talking crap about me. You're just putting them more of a spotlight on it and giving them credibility and putting them over. So I never did that. I just let it play out. But um, this legend has lived for 10 years. And I used to, Not to cut you off, but yeah. I used to hate. I used to hate that more than the anonymous shit talk mm-hmm. uh, when someone would bring it up to me. And it's like, I, you know, there was a time whenever, when I, when I first would get anonymously shit on, it would be like, oh man, well, who is this? Is it, you know, because sometimes you read it and you're like, well, that's not a fan. They know too much. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And it's somebody I know. And, it, and then you reach a point where you're like, I don't give a flying fuck who this is. I have too much other stuff to deal right. with. I got, you know, I'm not going to even donate time to look at this, let alone be upset over it. And then you have some goofball like, oh, well, they, they, look what they're saying about you. Like, I don't care. I, I don't care. If you can't put a name on it and you can't come to me with yeah. it, I could care less. I have so many other things going on over here to worry about that the last thing, I absolutely last thing I give a shit about is somebody who can't even put their name to it. And the, the, the thing that always drove me nuts is, is, is the guys who would read themselves get talked about and then – take to their Facebook to defend it. Oh, yeah. Because if there's 17 people reading a message board, but you have 2,500 Facebook friends, all you're doing is glorifying it and telling people, hey, here's a place to go to yeah, read a bunch I, of... A I know you don't know about this because you're not a troll who looks at this stuff, but guess what they're saying about me over here mm-hmm. on this thing that like a mm-hmm. dozen people freaking read? All it did was shine a light. And um, that ha- that was the legacy of this segment for a long time. People would use that to talk about... Um, how terrible I am or how terrible Jimmy is and, and mm-hmm. clearly the intense hatred that we still share to this day between well, the, each other. Like for me, and it has, that's, that's this, why you have the pillow fort between you. That's why the pillow, <laughs> yeah, pillow yeah, fort yeah, was yeah. in my contract. This is nothing against you or Wally or any, I mean, you guys were nothing but nice and I never held any kind of animosity towards you or anything like that. But for me, it was really the beginning of like a, a negative turn that my life took because after that, you know, I had a falling out with AIW and then it was, uh, I was, Thanksgiving Day 2009, I was in a brutal car accident, and I thought I could shake it off. Nothing was wrong, and the effects never wore off, and I found out I had to stop wrestling, and uh, I'll never forget this. This was in January 2010. There was only two people who, after I had said what had happened to me, I made the decision, well, I'm going to finish out the year for Chuck. I'm going to help Chuck out because Chuck had just started taking over IWC. The doctor initially told me to quit, and they said if I wasn't going to quit, then take six months off. Well, I could do just IWC for 10 months or whatever. Joe Dombrowski and Ray Rowe were the only two people who were like, do not listen to anybody telling you one match every other month or whatever. Well, do this for yourself. And honest to God, in my entire life, the only thing I regret is not taking those six months. Because, yeah, oh, well, I helped out IWC and this and that. And Chuck, uh, in December, Prostate Pro ran their first show. Marshall, whatever that's called, Prostate Prospect. But, uh, Pros- I drove with, Prospect I drove with Pro Chuck. Wrestling. I drove with Chuck, and we were catching up on old times, and I had brought up. I said, you know, thank God, aside from, like, you know, uh, some numbness in my hand and my leg and stuff, I don't really feel any effects from that car accident. He looked at me and goes, what car accident? He had no idea. He had no idea. And that's not a knock no. against Chuck because, you know, I still like the guy and everything. And, and I don't think well, we, knew, we knew his fans either, right? What I did – didn't yeah. matter to him. He sold the company five years later. Yeah. Uh, I could still have been wrestling. You know what I mean? It got too much to me. It, 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 it built up to the point where I had to, 2012, I was like, uh, I'm yeah. done. Because uh, I was killing myself in the ring to help out for people who were either shitting on me behind my back or not appreciating what I was doing. Uh, me and Flexor and Elias, Logan, Jeff, whatever you want to call them, uh, Palace, a couple other trainees were the only ones helping Flyer. And then people were going behind my back shitting on me, as Joe yeah. was saying. I said, you know what? I don't need this. I kindly came, finally came to my senses, and I had to take a breath and walk away. And it's not until you take a step back and you really cut ties and you look and you see how juvenile and how immature and really disrespectful people can be 
in indie wrestling. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to use the term professional wrestling because I've never really professionally done it and been paid. But as far as the local indie scene can go, there will be guys who will be mad at you for not shaking their hand and doing like an insider handshake, but they look like they're one pizza away from dropping over dead because they don't take that. Their idea of respecting the respecting the business is, Oh, I'm going to give you that extra smooth handshake, but I'm going to look like a lot of shit rolling around the ring and wrestle in a t-shirt and some shorts that I bought from Walmart. To me, that's a joke. The easy thing to do is honor this tradition of shake my hand and, you know, I'm going to be nice and Get the fuck out of here with that. If you want to be an athlete and do something athletic, well, then look the part. Act the part. Be a man. Because my experience always was there's three types of men when it comes to wrestling. There's boys, there's marks, and then there's men. Like, as far as Joe goes and Wally, they were men about the whole situation. They were nothing but men. They even offered to pay for me for something that I didn't take part in. You know, and, and then you run into people who are assholes about things and they'll use it to their own agenda. They'll spin it and they'll say, oh, Joe and Jimmy hate each other. Or, Jimmy's a pervert. Or I ate shit for so long after that. People saying, oh, I, I wanted to rape Greg Iron's little brother and stuff. If you can twist something and turn it into that way when it was never, like Joe said, never explicitly stated sexual, then you're going to do that. But that's just, you know, that's, that's the sad thing is that there's a lot of assholes out there who will ruin a good time. And, and the thing for me about, you know, people ruining good time and things of that nature is I always looked at this like a business. And even when I was first starting and I was literally making zero dollars doing this, I, I took this like a business and I wanted to lay a foundation to where I could make money later on. And, and to me, when you've got people that would, um, knock anything, not, you know, obviously not just this segment, but just anything in general, as far as this anonymous smack talking, uh, I never had time for it because it wasn't making me money. And it was just, mm -hmm. and, and it, and I don't want to sound like, you know, some jaded, like, Oh, it's only, only about the money, brother, brother. Cause that, that's not what it is, but it was about getting yourself in a position to be successful. Well, yeah, this. exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and not even so much money is, it, I mean, yeah, that is the bottom line for everything. Uh, time is money. You know what yeah. I mean? And I'm not going to waste my time thinking about somebody who can't put a name on their shit. And also on top of it, you know, if you're in this, you're either doing it as a hobby, which is an absolute waste of time. Cause I can't think of any other hobby you would want to do where you destroy your body. You know what I mean? That, that to me, that's retarded. I know that's not a PC word to use, but the definition of retarded is what that is. You know what I mean? You're, you're doing something counterproductive that makes you look stupid and foolish. Whereas you, you know, I always had the mindset that you had, I want to get better at this. So if I'm getting advice from somebody, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Don't hold back. You know, give, mm -hmm. give me the good advice. Tell me how I need to improve. I want to get better. I want to work with people who know what they're doing. I want to work with people who are good at what they're doing. I don't want to work with people who are just doing this for fun or a hobby or be the local hero. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, and or have their own agenda to shit on me when I'm not looking. I think that's why me and you always gravitated towards each other. 100%. 100%. I, I, I saw that, again, that desire to get better and the desire to be something more than what you were. Um, and uh, just whether we were discussing things creatively or discussing the business in general, um, it clicked. It clicked for sure. And, and we were thinking with uh, a very, very similar mindset. Well, and two, you know, we joke around and say we were ahead of our time with the whole thing, but you kind of have to change with the time. And a lot of times you'll see people even nowadays, like IWC, for example, and I'm just using this because that's the only company I really keep up with or follow, especially locally. You'll see people say, oh, that's not my IWC or IWC and what it used to be. It's like, well, no, it's not. No company should be. You know, you, you should mm -hmm. always be changing. You should always be evolving, whether you're a company, a person, a place. And it, it, that's if you get left behind, that's why, because you're not changing. You're yeah. not adapting. You're not mm -hmm. evolving. For sure. Talk about um, some of the feedback you got after the Predator uh, oh, spoof had first Like aired. I said, I had never realized how much of an audience the show had reached until I got the feedback. And it was uh, people, a lot of, oh, there, was a, there was a lot of older women who would always message me for PWO shows. 
I, I don't know why. Maybe it's because I'm I'm short or a boyish charm or whatever. But they would. That's I, would why I always, liked you. I would, I would always have a lot of <laughs> older women who are into me, and I lost my older women demographic with that because immediately they were like, "You sick son of a bitch! How could you do this? How could you do this? You know what were you thinking?" And then there was the guys who were like, "You know, you're a pig. I hope you get your ass beat. We're gonna be waiting for you at Resolution. That kind of crew. You know, they all they always, oh, we're gonna be waiting for you, and." I think you can count on one hand the amount of times there's ever been fans waiting for, for people after a show or before a show. And then there was the people laughing who got it. You know what I mean? Right. There was people like, I showed this to my friends who aren't wrestling fans, and now they actually want to see it. They want, they want to see the show. So the amount that I got was what stunned me. And then I remember the first person from Cleveland who called me wasn't you. It was Chandler Biggins. And he was like, oh, my God, this is, this is crazy. <laughs> you know, I can't believe you guys went through with this. Yeah. Um... I didn't get any feedback on on that Sunday night, but uh, boy, howdy, was my Monday morning something. Because <laughs> um, I got woken up to the uh, most unpleasant phone call of my life. Um, <laughs> was it Kilkenny? No, they, it, it, w- it was the promoter. Because Kilkenny called the promoter, and the promoter called me, um, bitching about... Um, the segment because i don't think i don't think that the promoter had ever actually watched it i think we i I told him about it but i think it went right to the director from from us um and he had to get called into the station and got read the riot act which um i felt terrible about for about two and a half years till he fucked things up worse than I did when he got himself in trouble, but that's a whole other episode of a whole other show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I felt very, very guilty for a long time because I didn't want to be that guy, like yeah, I said before. But you Nobody weren't. wants to be the guy who kills a promotion. You know? But I, I felt worse than I, I could ever remember feeling for a period of several days. Like, eventually, it, it got to, okay, I need to snap out of this and, and produce the Resolution show that was two weeks later, but I, I felt terrible that... Um, that had had shaken my confidence, that had shaken my creativity a lot. And the reason that the network was so upset was that people were sending in complaints. Um, And that is what got the... And what was um, also bad timing is this was just two weeks after, completely coincidentally, another wrestler had used a politically incorrect word that you already used earlier in a promo... And that got a complaint. R, R word? Yes. Um, which, it was what it was, isolated incident. But then two weeks later, there was a lot more complaints for this specific piece of footage. And um, and it came down hard. And there were... there were um, The promoter had to get called into the office and get yelled at. And I, I think our contract got restructured. There was there was a lot of... I, uh, you know, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but I never understood, like, the whole... I totally get homophobic slurs. Absolutely get racial slurs. I never understood the backlash against the term retarded. If you're using it in a sentence where, you know... If, okay, if you're calling somebody who's mentally disabled retarded, that's horrible. But if you're describing someone who's making it... A decision like okay, if you call a fan retarded, that's wrong. But if you're using it to describe somebody who's doing something that is unbelievably stupid, isn't that appropriate to call somebody? Hey, man, you're acting kind of retarded right now. Like it's a medical definition. Like if uh, you know, if you were, <laughs> what's next? If you if you run into a wall or you're not paying attention, I said, what are you blind? Am I gonna be in trouble for calling you blind next? You know, I I, I don't understand. I guess it's like uh, you can't call midgets midgets anymore. They're little people or they're smaller people. And if that makes them comfortable, that's fine. You know, I, I just – I don't understand. I get called short all the time. You know what I mean? I get, I'm a straight white guy in 2019, so I'm the devil basically. But what they don't understand is that I'm more open-minded than pretty much anybody. You know, so I don't understand terms that can be used and can't be used. So it's so it's like a landmine. You know uh, again, I, mean? I think you know, it goes back to just – people not looking at context and um you know like jim Cornette has been put under fire lately for some of the the remarks he's made that people have interpreted as homophobic um i feel like i'm a pretty um okay judge of that type of thing 
uh, I understood the context of what Jim meant in, in terms of Jim was critiquing the AEW pay-per-view as far as just the athletes in the battle royal all looking ridiculous without an explanation. It was not a personal attack on the one partic- one particular person he had mentioned in that. Um, but that person was offended. Jim apologized, and it should be, you know, whatever. Um, but it comes down to context. Um but yeah, that, that Monday morning phone call was very bad, and I was told to take that footage and stash it away and to never produce it again. <laughs> um, because 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 of that segment, and here's the thing: is is I don't absolve the fact it was a misread on the audience and and wrong placement, wrong um, wrong platform. Like I said earlier off air, if you would give me an hour on HBO, I think I could get that over, um, but not on Sports Time Ohio. Um, so a lot of people complain. A lot of people complain to the network. No one complained to us directly, which was a little bit suspect, but that's okay. <laughs> Bottom line is, is that it didn't, it didn't fly. It didn't get over the way I wanted. It was a misread of the audience, and I should have taken into account there is a percentage of the audience that's going to interpret it. Um, in their own way, not at face value for what it is and what it isn't, but they're going to fill in the blanks on their own. And unfortunately, as a result of that, the Jimmy DeMarco Gregory Iron match got scrapped for Resolution Two, and Greg got shifted into a side story, and Jimmy had to go away for a while um, and let that cool down. And that's something that, again, Jimmy mentions um, me reaching out to him and me trying to make things right, and that's because it was my fault. Jimmy did nothing wrong except for follow instructions and collaborate with somebody that um, he felt safe collaborating with. In pro wrestling, it's all about trust. If you don't have trust, you don't have anything. Yeah, and but I, I never felt that there was any wrongdoing. I, I think it was just like you said, there was just wrong audience. You know, yeah. to me, to me, it wasn't any like, oh man, I'm missing out on a booking. And then, like I. No, and I knew, I knew who, you wouldn't take it as in that kind. of I know way. there's some guys who are like, oh, I need that money, I need that booking. Like I, I always had a real job. I always had a job to pay my bills. I've been working since I was 15. So I was never one of those guys who, you know, and I don't want to say, oh, I'm not in it for the money. Some guys are in it for the money. Some guys make enough money that they do make a living off of it. Whereas for me, uh, I couldn't live like that. I could never live like, well, hey, I got to scam this fan. I got to scam this fan. I got to scam this fan. Uh, Here's my, uh, here's my Amazon wish list. Do you want to buy me something? Or here's my, your money to me is paying to watch me do something, and that's it. Um, I work in a field now, and I've grown up in a lot of ways. I mean, if I really wanted to scam somebody, I could absolutely scam somebody. I could should be careful what I say, but like I could probably I could really scam somebody. So it's funny when you see these like half ass losers who are like, "Oh, here's a t-shirt and eight by ten and it's like, really, do you want to scam somebody? Well, let's um sell somebody some. Uh, bogus real estate. <laughs> okay. I mean, you could do that. It's not really hard. It's it's really not hard. But it kind of goes back to what I was saying. There's a lot of guys in indie wrestling, especially when you go with like local and stuff like that, who are um, they're living the thrill. They're like the guys I was talking about earlier inside shark cages. They like swimming with sharks, but as long as they're in that cage, that's 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 their safety net. But if they ever actually get outside of that cage, then it's like, oh, shit, man. It's, these things got sharp teeth. You know, you, you don't want to swim with real sharks. But... And, and to clarify, most people aren't like that. But oh, no, there, no, there, no, are, no. there are bad apples no, in there. But that that's what I was trying live to live in explain. their bubbles. Absolutely. Absol- absolutely. 100%. What I'm trying to say is um, I think a lot of those types were the ones saying, fanning the flames of what was going on mm-hmm. and saying, uh, you know, I should never be allowed to, to wrestle again here. Or I should, you know, that shit never went away from me. That I, I had to wear that for a long time. I remember it followed me to IWC, even in Pittsburgh, people were saying stuff about like the, the perverted thing and this and that. It was after a while, it got old, you know, and, and, and you hope it's like, well, how long is this going to linger? Yeah. You know, cause you have other stuff going on and then it snowballs into that. And it's like, and, and that's the, that is a problem with indie wrestling when you go to some of those shows. And like I said, this goes back to being on the outside looking in. There is an aspect of taking advantage of people. You know what I mean? Like, okay, do you want these people to come back? Do you want these people to keep coming back? Well, number one, don't try and have sex with the fans. 
Not saying anybody, not, not saying a lot of people do this. But what I'm saying is, is that there are greater problems than what we did ten years. Oh, ago. without a doubt. You know what I mean? You've, you've, with, with, you've with got track. wrestlers. You got wrestlers now inviting fans on road trips, Ex- inviting fans into locker Thank rooms. You. Thank the you. goal of wrestling is for your appearance on a show to increase the sale of tickets. Yeah, and if you've got fans in your car with you or behind your merchandise table or you're trying to sneak them into the business because you are that desperate to need a friend, come on now. If you're taking away ticket sales, are you really that valuable? Exactly. So you just said it right there. You're kind of cannibalizing it in a way. People made what me and you did out to be like the Antichrist. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we did something out, uh, absolutely horrible and really we kind of put ourselves out there to be attacked and, and people bit. You know what I yeah, mean? Like yeah. When when there's far worse things that go on and have gone on and continue to go on, but that's kind of oh that's the business. You know, like well right. really what we were trying to do was sell tickets to a show. We were where, trying to get buzz. We were trying to sell tickets. We were trying to get people talking. We were trying to think outside the box. And in some ways it worked, and in larger ways it didn't work in that context. And. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're, you know, going back to talking about trust, you know, you trusted me to make the right decision in that situation. I don't feel that I did. And I, I felt remorse to that. And I, I felt indebted to you. And I, I, I have regrets in the sense that we weren't able to go back and finish that the way that we wanted to and should have. And I regret that we weren't able to move you past that because as you mentioned, you got into the car wreck a few months after that. Yeah, and, and like I, you know, I, I never ever held anything against you or Wally. There were certain promoters who I would work for who I fully trusted because for me, for a promoter, it, it wasn't just about money. It was, are people going to hear about what I'm doing? Are people going to see what I'm doing? Is there going to be a crowd there? Uh, you and Wally, I always knew there'd be a good crowd and people would see what I was doing. John Thorne and Chandler Biggins, I always knew there'd be a good crowd. People would see or hear what I was doing. Norm Connors, you know what I mean? Uh, Justin Plummer, he's, he's great at that getting a crowd there and stuff like that. Um, to me, that's a good promoter. You know what I mean? If there's going to be a crowd, people are going to find out what you're doing. That's all there is to it. And you had never, you and Wally were very clear that it was temporary mm-hmm. and that I would be back. So it wasn't anything bad or anything. Yeah. Oh, I'm taking the fall for something. I was totally on board. I, I was more upset that people didn't get it. I felt like I yeah. didn't do my job. I thought maybe I went a little too far, you know, being suggestive with certain things. And I felt bad. I didn't want to be the guy to kill PWO. Yeah. I mean, and I think in hindsight, anybody can look at it differently and kind of pick apart their role or, or whatever the case is. I think it's when anything goes wrong, I think it's human nature for people to immediately jump to, oh, this is my fault. How's it my fault? You know, what did I do? And and it was it just it, it got bigger than any of us thought it would in a way we, we weren't planned and, and expecting for. And um it went down in history. I mean, when I when I posted a few weeks ago that I had just unearthed the footage for the first time in 10 years, I had wrestlers messaging me, begging for a link to see it because they'd only <laughs> heard about the legend. I had fans commenting saying, oh, I remember watching that live and that was gold. And I'm thinking, where were you people 10 years ago? Why didn't yeah. you email the station? That's because, I mean, that's the story of, of life. Like most people who like something, it's the, uh, you know... The ones who don't like it who speak up and go on a, on a tirade and rant. Mm-hmm. The people who do like it are just happy with what they got and they don't have time. Yeah, you don't really hear people say like, "Oh man, that was great. That was great." You hear a lot of people like, "Oh, here's how I would have done it better." And that's the mentality a lot of people have is, "Well, here's what I would have done," or "Here's what I would have done." There's a lot of people out there who want to tell you how they would have done it, but they won't actually go do it. And it's it's just wild that a a seven minute shoot that we did ten years ago in a poorly lit living room <laughs> has has got these mythical proportions to it where people well, talk about I saw like Sorg had it on uh, the TV and yeah. when I opened the door it was real nice how the light was coming in behind it was like I was stepping in a light tunnel because it was it was the middle of summer I remember it was hot yeah. as hell it was and uh, you know we did uh, Jimmy DeMarco had one final moment in the sun in uh, PWO, no pun intended. You like how I did that? Yeah. Um, we did bring you back the end of that year, um, right after your car wreck, and you beat the shit out of Gargano. Yeah, I know. And I was so looking forward to everything we had planned. And, you know, then to find, like I said, it, the worst part is, is had I listened to doctor advice, I might have been able to go through with that just by cutting promos and, yeah. and then end up, because what, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Resolution was August. 
Mm -hmm. and I had a match. You know what I mean? Instead, I gave my time to people who didn't really fully appreciate it or, 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 you know, because that's another thing is if you would ask anybody either involved with IWC today or who follows IWC, they would have no idea. What, I, what was going on or what I did, you know, and, and I'll be honest with you, there's a really good chance that if I hadn't have done what I did, Chuck would have closed up shop. You know what I mean? Chuck might not have been, it, it, there's a lot of what ifs in that scenario that go on. And I didn't owe any of those people a goddamn thing. And I kind of wish that I would have been a little more selfish for myself because I, it does suck. Like I'm somebody who can really roll with the punches and move on with life. Uh, it did suck for a long time to not be able to do something that I was pretty good at and genuinely loved and had to have cut short because I was stupid with a lot of the decisions that I made and I live with it. I own it. And I, you know, like I said, I moved on, but at the same time, it, it does irritate me to think, well, you know, people are benefiting off of me killing myself for something I, in no realm, no, no reason ever should have done. You talk about the R word that that was me back then. I was I was very, and and you know what I, I remember watching and calling those matches. And there are very very few times, if ever, I can remember being more uncomfortable calling a match, just knowing knowing what I did about your situation, knowing how you were were you know gutting your way through it as best you can. And I I again I always respected. Um, what I would call, for lack of a better term, maybe loyalty to a fault, um, to whatever company or promoter that, that you put your body in the line for, because there is, I've said this before in commentary and it's a hundred percent honest opinion. Nobody has given more of themselves, mind, body, and soul for a company regionally than Jimmy DeMarco's done for IWC. And, um, there's a reason that he became one of the most popular champions in the history of the company and one of the most memorable champions and the champion that people legitimately paid to see. And that's because you could feel that heart and that passion and that guts and that willing, that willingness to do anything and everything um, for what he believes is right. You could feel that shine through in how he wrestled, how he talked, how he did anything. Um you know, again, hindsight, uh, as far as good call, not good call, whatever the case is. But how do you not look at, at Jimmy DeMarco's title ran and respect the hell out of what he's willing to go through for the company, for this business, for the people that are paying to see him to not let them down? Um, it, it, it truly is incredible. And I, I wish pro wrestling would have gotten um, a longer time with Jimmy DeMarco, full-time active professional wrestler. But, uh, man, when he was there, when he was doing his thing, he was always on beyond 10 out of, t- uh, beyond 10 out of 10. And, um, I mean, there's not much, there's not much to compare him to. Mm-hmm. Jimmy DeMarco bled this business as long as he was in it. And, and, and I respect the hell out of every contribution he's made to it. Well, thanks, Joe. You're going to make me cry. I'm lucky I'm wearing sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's, it was kind of good timing because there's actually been, we've dropped a lot of the old IWC archives on YouTube, which includes the majority of that run, I believe. So, Oh, yeah. And yeah. matches with so, Ray Rowe, matches with Necro oh, yeah. Butcher, matches with the Gambino family. The, the, um, these are major memories for me getting into indie wrestling. Yeah. And, and, and major memories for me as. Um, as an announcer and, and everywhere I've been, everything I've done, I'll still, if people ask me, Oh, what's your favorite match you ever called? Which by the way is an impossible question to answer. Please don't <laughs> ask me that question. <laughs> it's like asking a parent, their favorite child and they have 6,000 kids. It's not, you're not going to get a good answer, but if, if you're going to gun to my head, make, make a list. Top five is absolutely DeMarco beating Shima Zion for the IWC title. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that meant so much. And I, I felt that emotion that meant something to me. Um, so I know it meant something to them and I know it meant something to the fans. Um, you know what else you can see on YouTube, Sorg? What's that? You could see Jimmy DeMarco to catch a predator because that it's, is now, right. it it's is now there. up youtube.com backslash Mr. Joe Dombrowski. I've just launched that this afternoon in conjunction with the launch of pro wrestling 
Now, uh, Sorg, it does an incredible job. Indie Wrestling US does an incredible job as far as streaming platforms. And uh, this is the Joe Dombrowski library taken to the next step. Because mm-hmm. at this point, we have over 250 hours of content available uh, through rental, purchase, or subscription. And uh, including PWO TV episode number 50, which does feature Jimmy DeMarco <laughs> Catch Pro. Oh, right on 50. A nice round number. Yeah. Well, it was it, it was a, a marquee episode we had to celebrate for some way, and I couldn't think of a better way to celebrate than to try to get thrown off the air. There you go. <laughs> um, there you go. At least what it ended on a round number. <laughs> so all of my uh, original documentaries, uh, the Prime Wrestling Archives, the Premier Archives, the Welterweight Archives, some Border City Wrestling, there's, there's, and there's going to be stuff continually added by the week as time goes on, but I encourage you guys to check it out. You can subscribe subscribe for one low price or you can rent and purchase uh uh individually the the entire episode of the catch predator is available for a 99 cent rental but you can watch that clip on youtube for free as as we launch that and get the are there any like there. hidden easter eggs of uh you like doing a strip tease on the roof of like uh a building you're running or well what do you what? mean what do you mean <laughs> hidden that'll just be behind a paywall Perfect. There you um, go. Perfect. But yeah, that's uh that's you, something you, I've been working I, on. I see you've learned some, some lessons from me. <laughs> Well, I'm, not the dancing part. No, you, <laughs> you gave me the paywall and you you gave me the uh, flagrant nudity. It there all works go. out well. There you go. Flagrant Can nudity. you believe how mild mannered I was before I got in the business? Then I met Jimmy, and now I'm now I'm a complete mess. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but no, ProWrestlingLibrary.com has uh, uh, a lot of great stuff. It's also JoeDombrowski.PivotShare.com if you really want to be anal about mm. it. Um, but we're putting all the archives up there. I'm going to dip back into the Cleveland All Pro TV. I'm going to dip back into some other stuff I have nice. uh, permission nice. to use that I haven't asked for permission yet, so I'm not going to plug it. But uh, <laughs> um, keep an eye out for that, and, and, and please visit that and, and, and my YouTube channel as well for a lot of nuggets and previews. I'll be posting uh, probably a Virgil preview, a Zach Allen preview. Mm. I'll be doing like little couple-minute snippets here and there just nice. to give people an idea of what's on there. Um, but I thought this was the time, this was the place to tell the untold uh, Jimmy DeMarco story in full. Cause everybody thinks they know everybody thinks they have an idea of what was happening, what was meant to happen. What wasn't setting and straight. The urban legend. We got to set straight. Dude, the you urban. need to, for your uh, thing, you need to like bring back bum fights. You need to be like, <laughs> what? The, you need to be like the new uh, bum fights promoter. You need to, I mean, just go right down. To, down hey, I way. haven't claimed that one for for any wrestling network, so you can have that. There you go. There, there's potential there. There's there you potential go. there. If, like, as long as your shit doesn't involve waffles, I'm cool. Well, no, I you got the waffle mark cornered. There you go. But you know, we're never gonna find out. Um, you know, uh, the specific circumstances of some of the urban legends in, in the wrestling world. Like, we may never know truly who was in on Montreal. We may never know. <laughs> who truly was behind the deaths of Gino Hernandez or Dino Bravo or David Von Erich. Uh, you know, we, we may never know truly if, uh, um, you know, why Bruiser Brody was stabbed. But now we know why Jimmy DeMarco and I made asses out of ourselves on national, <laughs> semi-national television. <laughs> so we got that solved. We got that out there. Um, and hopefully that'll uh, either quell the legend or maybe make it grow even further now that people have an outlet to watch it i don't know jimmy do you have any final reflections about this whole winding road we've been on together where we're 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 yeah i wish we were still on it i i I do i miss (laughs) like uh that's the thing honestly that's the thing i miss most about wrestling is like traveling with you and flexor and Lawyer flashcards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll let everybody guess who had those. Yeah, there's me and Dombrowski. Had so uh, Dombrowski was always like a uh, straight man to my. To, you were my good cop. Right? Ironic, isn't it? I know, ironic. Yeah, when you think about it. <laughs> we rotate, we switch, we switch hitters. But like, uh, got to be versatile in this business. You have to, man. You got to adapt. But like the. Uh, that's what I miss the most. You know what I mean? That's what, honestly, man, like when I was talking before about how that was kind of like the beginning of like a dark period for me, I went from having like this group of friends, whether it was like you, Chandler and Thorne, or you and uh, Flexor and Facade, like our traveling crew, and it was just gone. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it was like, mm-hmm. and then I got hurt, and it was like I was super alone. And then it was, you know, fuck, man. I mean, it sucked for a while there, which makes it even better because you know what? That's life. Life's a bitch. And mm-hmm. not only is she a bitch, man, she's a nymphomaniac and she will fuck you. So you can do two things. You can just let her do it and cry and no one's going to feel bad for you. Or when she rolls over to text her friends about how bad she just laid into you, 
just jam your face between her ass cheeks and, blah, 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 and just give it right back. Because that's what you got to do. You got to keep going. And now that I, is I, a metaphor. I you see how he can tell stories? That, that is a good way to end the episode. By the, well, I got wait, 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 I gotta wait, mention too. Well, Joe, that, Joe, I have plenty more to talk to you okay, about. Okay, no, I, I understand. I'd love to give you some more time. I understand. I, but, but I got to mention just as, as a little denouement to this that yes. uh, uh, Greg's little brother turned out okay too. He's, yeah. he's doing all right. Yeah. He's, he's wrestling today. Uh, Zach Thomas, formerly known as this, Silas Morgan. This is the where are they now? Yeah, he's here now. He's he's in wrestling yeah. still. Um, so I, f- I filmed several of his matches. He's very good. He, he's still doing well. I I mean, he seems a little angry. It might be some of that like uh, PTSD yeah. based on maybe, him. stalking him. Maybe, I'm not really maybe, sure. Maybe maybe Jimmy like Jimmy's plan worked. And uh, I don't know is. if he's smoking the best cigarettes. And I'll have to ask him. What, what, what do you think, Jimmy? You think if uh, like Camel a year, 99s, man. <laughs> you, you think if a year from now I send you a message saying, uh, "Hey, Zach Thomas is available for a date. You got one more match in you?" Oh yeah, I mean, like the oh, way I look at that'd it is, be perfect. I'm kind of like uh, that's the lights. The lights not always on, but I'm always open for business. If you know my number, Aha. I'm like a that sounds shady, like shady that sounds like that should go down in Cleveland <laughs> to, from the sound. I, I haven't wrestled in Cleveland in like ten hey, years. Yeah. Like a, after ten years banned from Cleveland, Jimmy DeMarco returns. <laughs> Allegedly, I think my banned last match Cleveland. in Cleveland was either I don't remember if it was me and Super Oprah or me and uh, Michael Paris, Joaquin Wild against Faith and Nothing. Wow. By the way, can I, can I just point out? Just talk. You brought up our buddy. Um, how many years did did DJ Z spend angry that nobody could spell and pronounce Shima? <laughs> and now he gives us Joaquin. I have to Google search it every time I try to write it. Joaquin, man, yeah. like Joaquin Phoenix. He's gonna win an Oscar for the Joker. No one named Phoenix. I'm calling ever it right over. now. I'm Whoa. calling it right Whoa. now. Anyways, Joe, this has been amazing. I want to talk to you, of course, about Triple Mania and your experience there and everything as well. But uh, everybody, go check out check out uh, again the links again. You can go to youtube.com backslash Mr. Joe Dombrowski for the uh, Mr. Hands the, <laughs> for the for the YouTube link, or you can just search Jimmy DeMarco to catch a parrot. You can search my name; it should come up. Um, and uh, you can go to prowrestlinglibrary.com to see the first. I think at this point, got fifty some, sixty some episodes of, of yeah. that TV run. All the resolutions, premier welterweight. Uh, all, all the originals and so much more. We'll be adding stuff by the week. It's prowrestlinglibrary.com. That is a host site for most of all of what I've ever done. And, of course, you can still catch all the new releases here on IndieWrestling.us as well. Of you course. guys have been a great partner, and you're going to continue to carry the, those products as well and mm-hmm. until you get pissed at me and kick me out. Oh, you never know these days, right? <laughs> and, Jimmy, of course. Hey, oh, Jimmy, I know you're not much on social media these days but i know you were all over youtube maybe he's got an alias maybe he does i don't know if you want to reveal that i love it you're out there you're out i don't know if you want to share that un jefferson's my instagram it was uh jungle gym one or something i don't know you can find i didn't know your new one i'm always on there i'm on instagram i love instagram instagram's the best jimmy has anybody has anybody offered to suck your muscles lately uh well, I mean, the offers I do get aren't worth taking up on. You know, mm. it's, I'm very selective. The first thing in the, and by the way, the first thing I saw in the chat was Jimmy's going to make you suck his muscles. <laughs> um, yeah. There was uh, a, real quick before we go, there was an old lady when we ran the one. Remember the Franklin shows Norm Connors used to run? Absolutely. Night of Legends. I remember I, she was standing, the lady who was like helping him run the show, the lady who represented Franklin, she was standing right next to him and I pointed and I said, and you, and I, I think she was talking. I said, you, I'm not leaving here until you suck my muscles. She went, suck my what? <laughs> suck his what? And Norm was like, hey, he's talking to me. And I'm going to go do it right now. <laughs> and she was like, what the fuck? You can tell she didn't know what she I just got it. herself into. He was like, no, it's not like that. It's not like that. Fantastic. Uh, Great. Again, context and people read into it whatever they want. And 100%. if they want to get offended, they will. It. And we'll find out if people get offended from this show. I'm offended right now. Thank you so much, everybody. Go check out everything. Again, his site, IndieWrestling.us. And please, until next time, please support Indie Wrestling and don't get anything kicked off the air. <laughs> This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.